I am here. Here. Services Manager, Director Kling, Casey Lanziger Pierce is online, and we have with us the mobile services team and some of the adult services team, and they will introduce themselves later. Thank you. Um, review of the in, um, agenda. Are there any changes to the I agenda? Ask that we flip and have our new business first today so that our folks can uh, do their presentation and then get back to work, and then we can do our old business part of the presentation. Okay. Um, I would like to add regional library to the agenda. Okay. <clears throat> All right. We have two changes to the agenda. I need a vote. That's what I'm working on. I need a vote to one move uh, new business ahead of old business and go through that first and also to add regional library to the agenda. Do I have an emotion? I so move. Do I have a second? Sure, second. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Um, so with that being said, I will hand it over. Who's going to be my spokesperson for mobile library? So we're going to go out and do a tour of the bookmobile. So we will um, not be in this room for those of you who are online who won't see us for a few minutes as we go out and take a quick tour of our bookmobile. It is 1.13. Oh, are we good? Am I on? Okay. Hi. Okay. This is Kendra Adams, Chair for the Long Range Planning Committee. And we have returned from the bus tour, um, the Bookmobile, which has its new wrap and it's real exciting. And we are going to continue on with our meeting. And I call the meeting back to order. All right. So we just wanted you to have uh, you know, go out and take a look at the bookmobile so you would see what it looks like if you've never been on it before and the kinds of things they have on there and kind of the conditions that the staff face when they're on there. Today happens to be a beautiful day. And although there is heat and air conditioning on there because the doors open so much when you're on there, sometimes it's very hot in the summertime, especially when we've had these 90, five degree, 96 degree days. It also can be very cold in the winter time. And we have canceled stops when the temperature goes below a certain level <clears throat> or above a certain level because it's just uncomfortable to be on that vehicle. But these amazing people are gonna tell you about what they do along with our adult services staff who also do outreach programming. So go ahead guys. For just for a second, we'll move a few things around and we'll get everybody in the right place. I think it would be best for y'all to present sort of over by where Ann and Kendra are. You'll see the screen and then the internet will see you. I'll bring you that microphone momentarily. You're going to want your clicker. That's fine too. Um, and that's fine. Um, it's not a problem either way. Like Dealer's the choice. Just right. wanted to do it. presenting for you. So Tucker is going to start. I will speak up. Can you hear me? 
Can, can you hear me, Ron? I can hear can you. Hear me, Ron? I can hear you. All right. Uh, as Katie mentioned, my name is Tucker. I'm a mobile services assistant here at the Clearview Library District. Um, what does mobile services do? Well, first, uh, first and foremost, mobile services in the bookmobile um, work as a way to serve the underserved populations in our district. Um, unlike a lot of districts, our underserved populations are not traditional. Um, you might think of homeless populations or immigrants, um, ours being an affluent town. Our underserved populations are more children and seniors um, who are unable to get to the library due to not being able to have a car or they're immobile for some other reason or they rely on their adults to take them to the library. So we meet that need um, by bringing the library to them. Um, according to the town of Windsor's website, two of the town's largest demographics are young people ages zero to 19 and seniors uh, 55 and up. We serve them by our neighborhood stops and um, lobby stops, which our adult services department will talk about more, as well as our stops at our 55 plus resort. Um, we do this through district bound boundary line stops, which go as far as West Greeley in our stops like Mountain Shadows, Hazleton Park, and our new stop Sierra Acres, and South Windsor at our Cherry Park stop. Um, and again, is our, with our lobby stops and more passive programs like exchange shelves. Our department is also dedicated to growing community partnerships with local organizations and groups. Um, all of our district schools, um, businesses like G5 and High Hops, uh, the town of Windsor and the town of Severance, and the Rec Center, it's a big one. Um, we also work to expose and advertise our library. Um, the Bookmobile is essentially a large moving billboard. And we spread, um, we advertise local or the events that we put on, and that's 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 what we do. I'd say. Hi, hi, I'm Christy. Um, why do we provide mobile services to our community? Well, first off, we are a very people-focused social group of people. We love talking to our patrons as they come on and talking about how great the bookmobile is and all the services we can provide to them. And we're also very passionate about our community. Mobile services removes barriers to our library services. And it's shown the more barriers you can remove, the more likely they are to use our services. So the easier we make it for them, the more likely they are to come onto the bookmobile and to, to learn about our library. Um, and books and materials are delivered right to their neighborhood. How Good. I mean, how much better can it be? You don't even have to drive anywhere. They can just walk on over. This allows us to reach audiences that might not have access to our library. We bring the community everything that they could experience in the library to them in their neighborhood. In many cases, we are the first contact that a lot of people have had with a public library. You would be surprised how often we have people come on and say, what is this? How much does this cost? How much are these books? Um, they'll ask about how does this work? We didn't know there was a public library. Or some people are like, it's very nostalgic. A lot of um, people are like, I remember this from my childhood. I loved going on a bookmobile when I was a kid. And so they're really excited about it and they bring in their children and grandchildren. And one thing I was just talking to Katie about yesterday is that um, we've noticed since the new wrap has gone on, it has increased the interest in the bookmobile, especially at like community events. They're more likely to see what is, you know, we want to see what this is. They want to know, is this a new bookmobile? Or is this the same one? Like nothing. I have not heard, everything is so positive about the new lap. I haven't heard anything even negative at all. And last but not least, it supports all of our focus areas within our mission statement. It fosters early literacy, inspires lifelong learning, but above all, it builds connections with our community. We go into the community and we celebrate with them at festivals and community events, and it allows us to be part of the community we serve. Where do we go with the bookmobile? Um, you may have seen us driving around town. 
We go to neighborhoods primarily. We also go to a lot of schools. Um, we have 14 weekly stops um, and with the goal being to stay, to, to travel to our boundary limits of our district, not just stay close to communities around the library. Because again, most of our underserved populations live not that close to the library. Um, we go to schools to help enrich their own collections. Um, a lot of school libraries just don't get, don't have the budget to provide books, especially new ones. Um, and we can fill in those gaps. We also provide story times on our bookmobile or outside the bookmobile because you can't fit 100 kids inside of a bookmobile. Um, and we do the same thing at daycares. Um, we also go to pretty much every town event in Severance and Windsor. Um, you may have seen us in all of the parades. You'll see us at pretty much every town sanctioned or sponsored event. Um, things like the Halloween car Carnival, the Harvest Festival, um, Oktoberfest, the Summer Concert Series. And what's one coming up? Windsor Wonderland is a big one. Um, yeah, that's where we go. So these are going to be our combined stats for our events and our community stops. So in 2018 and most of 19, those were both normal years, normal service years. <laughs> and then you see 2020. Um, the one thing about 2020 is I am actually kind of proud of our event stats. And the stats of just the events alone were um, 1446. And those stats were slightly different than any other event we've done. They're not necessarily feet on board. They are, we went to um, the birthday parades and we joined the fire department with those. We went out to, we did our uh, summer adventure program caravan, um, got out into the communities doing that. We did, um, oh, well, it was great. So we, we also uh, participated in the Windsor High School graduation. And that was so much fun to see those kids drive through. It was just unorthodox way of doing it, but they did their best. And we got to like bring our cowbell. We had Lucy there, which is our bookmobile, and it was wonderful. Um, Oh, is that one done? Is this better? Okay, she'll let me know if it's better, right? Um, so yeah, so we still have Windsor Wonderland to go. So for our events this year, we are up um, beyond 3,000 people that we have been in contact with just this year for events. Um, that takes us to... Okay, so future of mobile services. So this is kind of our, our dream big. And we, you know, we're growing, we're obviously going to be much larger than we are now. But I do feel like we are serving our community so much better. And we'll see this later than um, even populations that are close to our size. So right now, when Lucy no longer runs, I would suggest replacing her. Um, now, this being said, she has a capacity of over 2,500 items, and you cannot get that on smaller vehicles. Um, she is 11 years old, and with proper maintenance, she may have another five years left, hopefully longer, fingers crossed. We go to parades with her, events, like Tucker said, driving around town. She is a huge advertising tool. Like, you see her, you clearly think, oh, Clearview Library. I mean, she's just in your face. So... Yes. Do I think we need a larger vehicle? I absolutely do. And that's going to take us to a fleet. So as we grow, and this is as time goes on, little by little, add to our services and what we do. Right now, um, I would suggest getting one or two smaller vehicles that we can take to our lobby stops, to our exchange shelves, to our uh, schools to drop off books, to our book drops. We're using our own personal vehicles for that, and mileage reimbursement is not keeping up with um, maintenance on our vehicles and gas. Yes. Can I ask you to repeat? So, are you suggesting we augment the current bookmobile or replace it with two vehicles? I would suggest in the future having a bookmobile on top of having these two smaller vehicles to run around with. 
So that way that replaces our vehicles. Because yeah, we're using personal vehicles to do all of that. Um, let's see. So yeah, so getting a smaller vehicle like a Prius or some sort of vehicle that has enough space that we can actually get our booth items in, say a table and a sign. So when we go to do events inside school buildings or even outside a coffee shop, we have enough space to be able to load our stuff in and go there. I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, a bookmobile is that, but you, you're, you're doing so many other things like, you know, setting up or presenting for, you know, outside mm -hmm. the kids. And it's hard to haul all that in that bookmobile right so I, I i get where you're going with this yeah but i well I'll, I'll refer to i've got some questions i'll ask you yeah absolutely <coughs> so then as we grow and that's just to start like that that would be a decent need now for what we're actually currently doing now so as we grow and our um needs become more then i would start to look at more of like a sprinter van and that we could actually kind of focus in on those collection areas for children we wouldn't have to take the bookmobile to say the classroom events we could actually take our sprinter vans there have it loaded with children's items and be very specific and the same thing with our adult stops we could load it with adult items and be very specific and then that saves on wear and tear of the bookmobile as well um can i ask another question yeah have you compared uh Sprinter's on Mercedes name, but Dodge, everybody makes it. Oh, right? yes. No, I've got so, Dodge on here. I have um, an e-transit e for Ford. Have you compared the space in your current bookmobile for bookmobile services, for book services? Yep. So um, the cargo capacity of the top end Sprinter vans, you know, the ones that have the six foot ceiling yep. and the length and the depth. Yes. So have, have you compared them? On your typical Sprinter van, you will get between 500 and 1500 items. And that depends on whether or not you have a lift with carts that you are taking off. You're loading, bringing them on, unloading, taking them off. You get five to 600. 500 to 1500 items. And your current on Lucy, you your get 2500 2, plus items on just Lucy alone. So yeah, and again, Lucy also is a huge advertising tool. You cannot, you can't deny the fact that she is a giant draw when it comes to advertising. Oh, I have a, I have a challenge. Your voice is somewhat high for my hearing range. I am so sorry. Okay. No, it's my I fault. I will take my mask right, off. But... There is a reason we have them on. Um, <laughs> I will take mine off. And I hope this helps. Does this help at all? It does. Okay, fantastic. Good. Um, Alongside a curve, um, and you're there for an hour, an hour and a half. There's nowhere to go. That's, you know, it's kind of an interruption. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, and not to raise questions or issues, because I'm behind this program 100%, so don't get me wrong, okay? But if, if you look at the bookmobile today, the biggest, one of the biggest weaknesses or deficits that has, it doesn't allow us to allow people that suffer from, uh, a, it's not ADA compliant. We can't lift people into it, and I think we need, need to. And if you look at a sprinter band, which I have, it's designed differently. So the only difference between the bookmobile and the sprinter, assuming that they have the same square footage, is physical approach, right? The bookmobile requires four to five steep steps to get it to the books. Mm -hmm. For a sprinter van designed differently, is basically a one-step ordeal function. So I'm not suggesting we get rid of a bookmobile. I'm just suggesting that the bookmobile we have may be somewhat outdated and not designed to really meet your need and the community's needs. Does that make sense? No, that makes total sense. Okay. So um, we try to meet their needs as best we can by bringing books to them and out to them. And we do have And, and I get and that, but would it be better, to Anne's point about where we have to have the book won't be where people can come in and meet on a cold day. It goes back to square footage. And unless my math is off, you'd end up with about the same amount of book square footage as before. The issue would be the number of books, I guess, because my assumption, if the book is one pound and you carry 2,500 books, that's the gross vehicle lifting weight of those sprinter vans is, is close to 10,000. So and I'm not arguing to get rid of a bookmobile. I'm just arguing to maybe consider upgrading it to be more beneficial to the community because I fully support what you guys are doing. So you're saying if we were to, when Lucy dies, we go ahead and get another bookmobile, but just make sure that it is. What ADA I'm saying compliant. is, I think the Sprinter Man makes sense. And having two vehicles that are really aimed with at, a bookmobile. What? Along with a bookmobile? No, I mean, replace the bookmobile with a Sprinter bookmobile. And then have a second sprinter van that allows you to do all the other things too. And if you run the math, you know, I haven't run it all, but. Again, most of our patrons, they, they come on. It's just like Ann was saying, they stay, they look, they, you know, with a sprinter van, that is difficult to do. You can't get because on there. Why would can't. it be difficult to do? Well, for one, you would have people, the amount of people you could have on there at one time would be diminished. And so if, you would- if the, if the square footage in the Sprinter van is the same as in the bookmobile, I struggle with why would you have- I don't think, I honestly don't think it is. I'd have to, I need well, to go and back think, and actually measure the bookmobile. To me, that's bookmobile. what I want to kind of challenge you with because I, I think by moving the, 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 the physical vehicle upwards, there's a lot of other benefits you can get. Those are four-wheel drive, mm -hmm. you know? But it's snowy and you guys are slip sliding down she does really well actually she handles beautifully in the weather just so you know like i okay but i mean so to me i, I i'm just challenging you not to just to make do with what you got at upgrading that i think this is a very important service that the library offers right and i think looking outside of the box versus you know can we put a new wrap on the old book won't be able to look and make, make it look better because you know, I price sprinter vans versus what I've seen that bookmobile is worth on the budget. And uh, we could probably come up with you know, the monies to do two vehicles like that, that <clears throat> allows you to provide a better service to the outlying community. And you know, our second largest financial contributor to the library is unincorporated the unincorporated areas right right that's where there's not a lot of people right yeah. that's where you guys go right yep <clears throat> yeah serve those guys um because of our acquisition of the x street property we're considering in our 2020 uh to budget about a hundred thousand dollars for a courier service and i'm wondering if this courier driver and vehicle might have a dual purpose and help you in, in what you're talking about. I haven't even thought about that. I didn't look at that at all. What do you think on that one, Anne? We, we have to look at that because the courier is going to be out to the differently. It's going to be out to the floor hauling up the books and materials from one place to another. So a different kind of setup and size of my work in some situations, but not all. Actually, 
actually said it, the answer is I'm intending to think of them separately because they're run by different departments for different operational purposes in the district. That said, it's not worth reviewing when it's time to make a vehicle decision here. Also, the uh, the courier Diane is going to be fixed a very finite fixed schedule. Two trips in the morning. I would, ima I would imagine it will be on a, on a route-based schedule. I don't know what its excess capacity will be, nor do I know what we'll be looking at in terms of insurance requirements or staffing requirements for additional driving to meet different operational needs. Um, it also kind of be the equivalent of like showing up in the warehouse when what you really wanted to bring was the bouncy house, right? You guys are more bouncy house than, than a courier van that's running routes is more warehouse. Another quick question. Do you have the ability in the current bookmobile to allow patrons to make use of our online services? Yes. Mm -hmm. We normally have an iPad on there that they can use. We have been actually with the discussing. Because um, I really, use. I didn't see a computer in, in the bookmobile. Right. So, so yeah, we have um, an iPad, but we've also been discussing putting a Chromebook on there as well. They are taken off right now because of COVID. Um, just germs. <laughs> But once we're back up and completely running again, yes, they have. And, and I saw you're pushing monies to do wireless and the thing. Correct. So they're they're testing. In fact, while you guys were touring, I was doing speed tests on the cradle point that's on the bookmobile How right now. How's it running? Uh, what's that? How's it running? Uh, it's running decently. We're, we're trying to figure out the best place to, to mount it so that we get the best experience for both staff and patrons. But so far, so good. I know they're working through some testing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do not have as much direct day to day, but what I'm seeing is it's improving things and we're not done tinkering yet. The, the issue then becomes what devices would we want to either make available uh, to patrons through that service or just what advertising we want to do because they bring their own devices to that. So frequently in our communities, folks have access to a thing. What they may not have is a reliable internet signal, particularly as you get more into rural. So we're hoping to improve that. Um, we have in the past carried, in fact, y'all have carried a handful of Chromebooks or a handful of tablets. We have done various things to create sort of a lab on the go environment. Um, the missing piece in the past was the internet connection. That's coming along now. So we may be able to experiment with more of those going forward. So just the follow-up or clarification, mm -hmm. clarification question. So my understanding is that we are working on having internet so that if I wanted to bring, for instance, my grandchild and at my house, I have a semi good iPad that I let them play with. Right. And I wanted to put, go there and have you help them or me get tumble books. We would have that. Right. Uh, yeah. reality at the, and and, and you then, already do have that. Okay. Yeah. And then you can also help people get new library cards. Oh, and yes. Yeah. We're a fully just, functional. I, yeah. Library. I Think of us just clarify. as a library outside. Four yeah, they can they can meet many of those needs on a one by one basis right now. What we're hoping to do with this cradle point is to roll up to the, the summer concert and be like, hey, while you're here, drink our Wi-Fi. So not only is the bus not only I'm serious, not only is the bus uh, uh, showing up, it's 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 a mobile experience for kids and families and all these sorts of things, but it's also just present as their access or ability to get to our collection without stepping on. I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. However, we still, yeah, we still are service you, them offline. We have wireless. offline capabilities. So. Yeah. yeah. And 5G is starting to be a factor, but it's always vendor this, vendor that. We've dealt with power outages. I mean, the, the bookmobile staff over the years have gotten me to get up close and personal with a lot of third party have you uh, ever, folks. Do you, you always park at the same spots? Is that just, yeah. uh, Until it's an unviable I, I cheated. stop. I, uh, you park at the park. My, my son lives across the street from where you park. And I went out and tested the strength off his internet. Mm -hmm. It was pretty good. Mm -hmm. So the suggestion might be to, just, to cut deals with everybody and just to have access to their... Uh, it's a neat idea. The trick is their schedule is so variable that by the time I get the deal cut, they might have moved down the block. But it's a good idea. I wanted to add something about the, being um, your question about being ADA compliant. Just having the bookmobile there is already removing a barrier. Sure, maybe they can't get onto the bookmobile with a wheelchair, say. But I work with a lot of kids at the schools that have disabilities, and all of them are able to get on through aids bringing them in. 
So we might not be able to serve like the senior population in a wheelchair, so per se getting them on the bus, but we're still removing that barrier. We're coming to their neighborhood. They don't have to get in the car. I, and there, and we, and, and we, I, I really hear you. I'm just trying to maximize it because it's really an underserved group, and we have to understand that. Yeah, like, it's it's really important to me too because I've been learning American Sign Language. I work with deaf communities. I work with a lot of people with disabilities, and it's really important to me. But I don't see it as we're not um, complying. We're we're actually accommodating them by bringing services to them. We come out, we, we will, at some of the um, 55 resort, we'll bring their hold into the inside of the building. They don't even have to come out if they don't want I to. I think like you have to determine what, what the federal law will be if you did put out a new vehicle because you may have to be ADA compliant. Yeah, we'll but, definitely figure all that out when it comes to time, but hopefully she's got a few years left. <laughs> um, I hate to keep going. They have a stop at two o'clock and they are, they're also part of the presentation here shortly. So, okay, so let's dream big here. And once we are like full district capacity and we're full running, this takes me to my next one. And this is a makerspace van. And Heidi is gonna tell you a little bit about the makerspace van. So books are a huge part of what we do with outreach services, but it's not the only thing that we do with outreach services. We also work with schools, we work with the city with their summer camp. Um, we go into schools to do STEAM programming. We do STEAM programming in the summer. And one of our dreams is to have the capacity to better serve our teachers in our town with STEAM and makerspace programming. Um, and so one of our dreams would be to have a vehicle that allows us to take um, STEM programming, makerspace programming outside of the library building and to our teachers into our town. It would allow us to partner with the city, to partner with the schools, um, before COVID, we did in-school programming full steam ahead. We do programming during the summer. Um, and this would allow us to not only expand the programming and partnership capabilities that the library would have to do STEM programming in our community, but it would allow us um, to take the strain off of our personal vehicles and be able to have supplies um, easily accessed in a makerspace vehicle. This could allow us the capability to do 3D printing outside the four walls of the library to um, support in the same way that we support school libraries by expanding their collection. This would allow us to expand our reach with the schools. Um, several libraries uh, nationwide and also in Canada have explored and have current running makerspace vehicles. This is a MakeMo which is run by LA County Libraries. There's also one that services rural communities in Indiana and another that services rural communities in Texas. Um, and they've seen a lot of success, a lot of excitement from their community. And it's yet another way to connect with communities and show them the resources that a library has um, beyond, not only books, beyond books um, and to, to continue to make lifelong learners that engage our world. So this is a big dream of ours is to expand the capabilities we have for STEM programming and to partner um, even closer with some of our um, great community partners um, would be a makerspace fan. To where we would actually keep these things. So this is our current garage. I'm going to let Christy kind of tell you about it. So as you can see, there's not much room for air. It's pretty tight. And it's already been expanded one time, I and about seven years ago, we were trying to. It was six inches total, three yeah. on each side. Just <laughs> yeah. before I started here, so. Exciting. <laughs> the, the excitement over those six inches was. Woo! <laughs> 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 yeah, it's and uh, so you have to pull. Make sure you pull it in very straight because if you uh, don't pull it in straight, it's more difficult to get it out. So. In and the we, future, we have to worry about like our drive-through patrons as well. Um, mm -hmm. You're always having to watch for that. And after uh, school, your mirrors, after school kids, you just you have to really pay attention with this particular garage. Mm -hmm. Dream, right. dream big. <laughs> that wasn't a false big dream. <laughs> <laughs> like the song says, "Dream on." <laughs> So as we grow and expand and possibly add some more regional branches, we our dream garage would obviously be bigger. 
Um, it would accommodate the bookmobile. And then if we add any sprinter vans or anything like that, we'd be able to fit all of that in there as well. Can I ask you a question? Yes. The environmental, environmental, you need a garage because the bus won't run without it. Is that a fair statement? A sprinter van does not need a garage, does it? At least one across the street from my neighbor's house does. It doesn't need one. Uh, if we're keeping thousands of dollars worth of equipment and and material inside, it might be a good idea. I hadn't thought of that one. Yeah, Colorado <laughs> weather is not friendly to us at all. Buy him a shotgun and let him sleep on it. <laughs> They're young, but I hadn't thought about his one point. <laughs> it seems to me that um, if the library is looking for vehicular space, there's probably other entities in the community like the fire district and the city that might also be in thinking about increasing their vehicles and maybe some type of commun communal effort, uh, cooperative effort with okay. I'm going to. Chase, I can't hear you. Um, I'm going to jump in here real quick. We do have a stop in, in just 10 minutes. So I'd like these people to get a chance to finish there. So, so could you jot down your questions and then we can um, get them back to them. Okay. I would like you to be able to finish your program. Is, is our stop, is your hard stop at 10 minutes, including their lobby uh, stop presentation? No, you guys, you guys, oh, we do yeah. just because of that. Thank yeah. you. Okay. It was for you. You were accommodating. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, so that takes us to what are other libraries doing? So the libraries you're seeing on here, that is their service population. Um, Lafayette's kind of close to what we're doing right now. High Plains is obviously what we may be here in the future. Um, Adams County is giant and huge. So now this, these are the difference with these service areas. Lafayette, they don't have a bookmobile and they just use their own vehicles to go service places like their lobby stops and um, delivery for seniors, uh, pop-up story times, they just use their own vehicles. High Plains, they have a fleet and they're kind of closer to what, you know, like I said, in the future, what we're looking at. But, but they don't have bookmobiles with High Plains, do they? Yes, they have, they have several actually, bookmobiles and they have they sprinter vans, they have um, smaller, smaller fleet vehicles, like they are what I'm, emulating. That is what I am looking at because that is going to be close to what we're at and in the future. Um, High Plains, obviously, well, you hit that, has a fleet. So Adams County, they have just, this, this I found really interesting. They have anything libraries. They serve um, Brighton, Commerce City, Federal Heights, North Glen, Thornton, portions of Arvada, Aurora, Westminster, the town of Bennett, and the to towns of Lock Bowie and Unincorporated, Henderson, and Stroudsburg, and Watkins. They have one bookmobile and that's it. So we are, you know, ahead of the curve on Lafayette doing what Adams County is doing. Um, but Adams County, what I found is like this golden nugget as I did all of this research is it had nothing to do with the size. It had to do with the needs and our needs are different than theirs. Those, those, those communities that have that one bookmobile or don't have one at all are urban. People can go, they have, a ton of branches. They can go to those branches, go to that anything library and get the services they need. We are going outside of that. We have rural communities that we are trying to reach and bring all of our services to. So that I thought was, you know, it was just a little bit eye opening because even Poudre River, they don't have a bookmobile or any like outreach, like they don't leave the buildings. They're in the buildings. Um, they have several branches, but they're they don't have like mobile services. Um, Loveland, they have a book bike and they're actually bigger than us. So again, we're ahead of the curve on that. 
as well, but they're more urban. Um, so that takes us to our budget. So ours um, this year was around $40,000 what our budget was. High Plains averaged over the last five years $165,000 for their mobile services. Now this does not include staff. This is just like mobile service budget. So this is vehicle maintenance. This is um, you know any kind of tech need that we would need, anything like that. Uh, Poudre River, they don't have a mobile services budget because they don't do mobile services right now. Now they are looking into it. She said, she's like, we would love a bookmobile. We are actually in contact right now with High Plains, picking their brain, trying to figure out what they're doing. Um, Loveland also doesn't have a mobile services budget. They absorb anything they do outside their building into an outreach budget. So that is that. And then that just took me to my nugget that I already shared. <laughs> Um, and that is the end of our presentation. And that takes us over to Jennifer's presentation. So why don't we take questions from oh, before you have to go. I had, why do you feel the need for two vehicles now? So the two vehicles would also, it would serve us going to our exchange shelves and, um, like daycares and anything else that we need to drop books off of and go and pick up our drops. The other vehicle I was thinking for uh, the lobby stops for Jennifer's crew, because okay. it's still part of like, it's a mobile service. Okay, just, um, I'm gonna follow that up, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, I know just enough. My daughter did mobile services for Aurora and she did have a lovely old van she got to drive. Why a car versus a van? I was looking at more economical stuff. Like I was actually looking at hybrid vehicles that have the trunk capacity to hold these items. Okay. Um, and that was just, so that way we could save on like gas, you know, and be able to maybe plug them in when we're here. Um, okay. One that's what I was looking at. And I actually have all the pricing and all that good okay. stuff too, if you guys need that. And lastly, because we do not have a space for these, and I have never had a new car in my life. Yes. Are you open to repurposed vehicles as in use? Absolutely. <laughs> and that was my other thing. Like, I mean, we would have to, if it's a now need and we would love to do it within the next, you know, two years or so, we would have to know it's going to be sitting outside. You're going to get damaged. And so I, it would be great to have it wrapped. So it's a very clearly clear view library pulling up and mm -hmm. representing. Um, however, Yes, that okay. totally open to repurposed vehicles. And then Anne can probably answer this. Are we up at Harmony Ridge um, towards um, the north side of our district? Tucker? We, we had a stop there. That was um, the Ridge at Harmony. Yeah, we had a the stop there that we, we saw one, maybe one person every week at. We tried it for a long time. <laughs> um, it started strong. Like that, it, that was a good stop and it started strong and it just dwindled, totally dwindled. And um, then to have, be a viable stop, we need a, like an average of 10 people per stop. Okay. Would that be something as it's grown up because it's already doubled in size. Um, would that be something that to you might try at? again in the spring or Absolutely. summer? Okay. I, Sorry, Tucker. I, we're talking about the people, places that are hard to get to a library. Yes. And they're on mm -hmm. the... They're the north corner of yep. our district. So that's that was my question. Yeah, I no, and I, I loved it. I had a little gal on there all the time who, I mean, she was just, she was great and she was just brokenhearted when we had to stop. But no, and I appreciate Yeah, I would definitely go back as up. Well. Don't get me wrong, but no. I it is almost doubled in size since, and I'm just wondering. Yeah, I think yeah, when oh, yeah. we were going there, there was not a, like a park or anywhere, like a central location where people would come. And that at the time is a big key to a lot of our stops is there's like a community park where we go, which draws in the people where we were just having a park like in a random. We were in like spot, a vacant like, lot. <laughs> so, so it was between two houses, but across from a mailbox, we were like, all right, the mailbox will, you know, draw something. Uh, we also canvas our neighborhoods. Like, so before we even start, we go out and we door to door canvas these neighborhoods, showing people we're going to be there, has our schedule on it. Um, all our information. Now or do you know? I don't know. I haven't no, looked back know. into it. Yeah, we haven't looked into it again yet. Thank you. Yeah. Ron had a question. Uh, look with a realistic lens. Could you kind of give us a timeline you're thinking about? Um, as far as the smaller vehicles, those those would be great in the next like year or two. In the next one. Year or two would be two? fantastic because okay. again we are using our personal vehicles and it's it's a lot. Um, as far as like your sprinter vans and the my big dream of like the steam vehicle that 
you know, that's years down the road when our population actually is booming no. like it's going to be. Thank you. Yep, I just had one more. You done, Ron? Yes. I would just say realistically, because of the chip and where cars are now, we, it probably is going to have to be, I hate to say this, but we don't see car prices loosening up until 2023. And because we are on the budget, um, unless um, Brian Lampy can find us a <laughs> great deal. You know, and maybe, you know, I mean, like I, pri I priced new. And so um, it wasn't outrageous, but it was definitely, yeah, I completely hear what you're saying. So a so, couple of quick questions. Uh, what's the age of that bookmobile? She's 11. She's 11 right now. She is 11. Yep. It's a female. It, oh, yeah. Her name is Lucy. <laughs> did, did we buy it new? Okay. And how many people staff the bookmobile on any given day? Two. Every time for safety reasons. Every time two. it goes out, it's two people. Yep. Uh, okay. You, I, I looked at the stats you had up there. Do you take the COVID out? They showed them dropping. And I've looked at the stats on the bookmobile for more years and they're fairly flat. You attribute that because we maxed out the ability of the bookmobile to service people? Or is it legitimate? What, what's causing that? I if think we had it could a bigger be... bookmobile, would you have more people? I guess is the question. I don't know that we'd necessarily get we more, more people based on a larger bookmobile. However, if we had um, other vehicles, say a Sprinter van, we could actually service two areas at one time. We would have the bookmobile somewhere and then the sprinter van elsewhere also servicing. So it's we could increase our service demands just by increasing the vehicles one. Um, and then also just as our population grows, we're going to be servicing more people. Yeah, That's the just population has grown to 2016 right. you know, pretty flat. But I but you only had one bookmobile too. We only have one bookmobile but three folks. And so that was my question. Right. I think I, I, that's what I said is yep. services are max. We, we can't service more because of the limitation of our capabilities. We have a finite amount of resources, but we, yeah, we are asked a lot. Um, increasingly over the years, the demand has gone up to service another assisted living facility, which I believe Jennifer will be touching on, um, to come visit more schools. But like Ann uh, pointed out, that's you know one full-time person leading that department and the rest are part-time. So there is a finite amount of resources. And is there is, a, or is it? a reason why our stats are, in 2021, we haven't been able to take the bookmobile to schools. And in a normal year, we would be visiting the schools during the daytime and the bookmobile st right. stops at night. Right now we're not able to do those daytime stops, which we will in the future. And that would increase our numbers. So my last question is, you showed your 2021 budget to be $40,000. That is what I found in our plan. And our, what is that constitute or what is that for? That's just the fuel and then Well, that was gonna be not my yet. question. Yeah. What's the what's the mileage outlay for the uh for your department every year? Do you know? It's um, possible you don't because I know that we don't show you that very often. No, I'd have to look uh per year what it is on an average. You don't talk to me about that often. Um <laughs> The other thing on the um, the budget is that's two percent of our overall budget. Like mobile services is two percent of your overall budget is of the entire room. library budget. It's two percent. Oh. So right. okay, thank you. It'd be worth knowing that mileage number because at some point it starts costing us more to not buy a car than to buy a car. Okay. Yeah, Does that I make sense? Definitely get that to you. And that's that that would be something worth looking at. And we can do it internally. I just wondered if you knew it off the top of your I can also look. I know we've got the yeah, we do track that. I've got it somewhere. Oh, yeah. It's it's in our maintenance log. I don't know if you can look Oh, okay. Up. Yeah, I can try to look that up. Okay. 
And I want to commend all of you because your stats look really great for this year. And if that's without um, schools, congratulations. That You've is, done a great that job. That is without schools. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just want to thank this team. They're some of the hardest working people I've ever worked with in libraries. So just well done. Good presentation, guys. Thanks, thank you. Andy. Thank you very Thanks, much. guys. Thank Appreciate you. it. Well done. Drive safe. Don't rush. Okay, so yes, I'm Jennifer Bradley. I'm the, the, the adult programming and collection development librarian. So, and this is Maria Mul Mulraney, as um, Anne just mentioned. She's new to our department, but uh, we kind of have a similar service uh, to mobile services in that uh, we call them lobby stops, but basically they're our um, senior outreach that we do to assisted living facilities and senior residences. So I'll kind of go with, oh, it's this. Okay, so also there's, and I forgot to mention, there's also a, another member of my department. She could not be here today, but that's Jennifer King. She's um, in the green and she's actually relatively new as well. She started in February. So kind of been working with um, a new team this year. Um, but uh, what we do is, and I'm going to move a little closely because unfortunately I'm not wearing my glasses and I need to. <laughs> Um, see this a little better, but uh, we do several things as part of our senior outreach services. So we do um, primarily we do um, deliver library materials to um, to seniors, um, particularly in like um, senior residences, um, and we that includes everything from books, movies, audio books, all kinds of different materials. We also do tech times. We use rather this is something we used to do pre COVID where we would have a staff member who's a, um, a little bit tech savvy, they would come in and kind of sit down at a table for an hour or two and just kind of be like a, the library's own little version of After Geek. Um, people could come with their phones, their laptops, their tablets, and just ask basic, um, you know, how do I get into my email? How do I start up a Facebook account kind of questions? Um, we'd also often use that as like an opportunity to kind of um, promote our e-materials since, you know, we're on the computer, might as well like show them the vast array of digital services and um, resources that we have to offer. And we also um, pre-COVID, and sorry, I also forgot to mention like during those tech times, we'd often get like two to four people um, per visit. And we usually did that. I think at um, the height, which was like 2019, we did it like twice a month. And that was really at our Good Samaritan stop, which I'll get to in a minute. But, um, okay, so jumping forward, back to library programming. Um, so prior to COVID as well, or 2020, we also, and this was primarily with Good Sam, because I have a great um, chapel area that was good for uh, having speakers come and visit. But we've also done libra eh, library programming um, at, the, at some of these senior residences. And I'll also kind of like describe or give you a few examples kind of later on in the presentation, but those are kind of like the three main things we do as part of our senior outreach, which we call a lot, we also call lobby stops. So, okay, so who do we serve as part of our senior outreach and lobby stops? We currently visit six um, senior living, uh, living facilities. We go to Good Samaritan, we go to Columbine Commons, the Windsor, Governor's Farm, Bright Assisted, and Century Three. And the people that we serve in these communities often have like different levels of um, accessibility. Um, some people are able to meet us in like a centralized meeting location, like a kind of common room that's on the facility. And in some cases, we actually go door to door and visit them in the rooms because unfortunately they can't get up and meet us in a centralized location. So. 
So um, here are some of the numbers that we do. And so kind of similar to, let me just follow, I'll follow along with my computer. But um, let me go to that slide so I can see the numbers a little bit more. Uh, okay, darn. Okay, um, bear with me. I will get a little closer so I can see these numbers, but um, you'll see kind of um, to what Katie mentioned in her own presentation is we did have our higher numbers um, pre-COVID. So really our best number was, our, our best stats were in 2019 where we had um, a, what, what I call um, 1,132 engagements. And so this is basically, um, the way our stops works is we visit certain facilities or the facilities that I listed previously um, each twice a month. And we have um, patrons, some are regulars, some are kind of periodic visitors that we uh, engage with per stop. And so kind of all added together, uh, I would say like for 2019, we have like 1,132 of those kind of visits where we're serving seeing people individually. And the total was kind of like a 181 stops that we did that year. And so those were our best numbers. Um, 2020, definitely did, um, we definitely took a big hit to our numbers. So um, in fact, many of the facilities that we visited actually at for a time, we had to stop lo doing lobby stops altogether. I believe it's either two or three months. But then once um, facilities, um, things started to get a little um, calmed down or um, people started to deal or get their hands a little bit better on what was going on with COVID-19, they started letting us visit the facilities, but we weren't allowed to actually go in. So we often had to do drop-offs. So that again, kind of really cut into our numbers because we weren't seeing the people, we weren't having the engagements and talks with them that we used to. And so that saw us take a hit in 2020. And 2020, when I put our numbers up there for this year, they're not, they're not incomplete. I mean, they're not complete yet. But um, another reason our numbers are kind of a little lower is when we lost or when we were not able to go into facilities in 2020, we kind of did a little bit of a reassessment of some of the places that we were visiting. Um, for instance, Good Sam, we were originally visiting it every week of the month. And so um, in order to kind of make it easier to visit the other five facilities that we were doing, we kind of cut them back to twice a month, which is now what we do for all the facilities that we serve. So that kind of did cause a little bit of a hit in our numbers, but we think it works better. It's a little bit of a less strain on staff resources and time. And especially um, it, it opens us up to serve future facilities um, such as uh, Tucker mentioned Resort, um, Resort 55. They actually initially asked us to do a lobby stop for them, but unfortunately we were going through a bit of a staff turnover at the time and we could not, um, serve, could not offer the service right when they asked. So they're currently, um, we offered them the lobby, stop, the lobby stop service instead, but we would still like to be open to visiting um, other facilities, especially as Windsor Severance populations continue to grow. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention is kind of our item, our item circulation stats. So in 2019, like we, we circulated about 2,920 items that year, which does not seem a lot like in the grand scheme of like how much this library circulates all together. I think I was looking at the stats the other day and it was either 2019 or some year that we circulated like 270,000 like um, physical items. But the thing about the stats is that, and something I meant to mention earlier is that, so between our six stops, we uh, visit about anywhere between 25 and 35 people between our six stops every month, or yeah, um, per stop. Or sorry, I'm kind of saying, basically between all the six residences, we service about 25 to 35 people. On average, like on the low end, these people, um, we check out anywhere from two to 10 items for these people per visit. So what's unique about our users is that they are high volume users. Um, I consider, and because again, we're also visiting these people like twice a month. So these people are receiving anywhere from 40 to sometimes 20 items per month. 
and you know i consider myself impressive if i read three bucks three books a month so and can i push on that a little bit more that's not a casual here's a book that is you're investing time in who are you what do you like to read what is that about i mean these are high touch visits too yeah so these are repeat customers who literally you're i mean it's not a casual encounter so that circ is not a good measure of the experience that the patron has as well as the the time it takes to do that properly exactly i was actually oh i'm sorry did you have well i was just going to say if i memory serves me right are the national average and it's four books per it's real low per vis, per per patron and we're at nine anyway so that fits our demographics in addition i just want to say you know thank you because we all know mental health for our elderly and our shut-ins is one of the most important things. And if you're serving that by engaging them, you're giving them a quality of life. Thank you. And in fact, that actually touches on my next slide. So, oh yeah, perfect. If you wanna do that for me, Katie. So why do we do senior lobby stops? So there's really two main reasons, um, providing library services to populations who might have difficulty at, um, accessing them on their own. And so, this is, and that is something that's very similar to what the bookmobile do, does. But the difference between us and our lobby stops, and I think I did kind of touch on this a little earlier, is that we deal with patrons who might have difficulty actually getting on the bookmobile and being able to get on, um, get on the, uh, sorry, get on the bookmobile and browse uh, the material. So we deal with people who we basically are better able to kind of meet them exactly where they're at, whether it's a meeting room or their own like personal apartment. So we're just a little bit more accessible in bringing the materials to them. And also kind of as Bud touched on, we are also a bit of a concierge service. So we often, when we are visiting these people in person, we have conversations with them. We learn what they're interested in. We often learn about, you know, what's going on in their personal lives. And um, we, also, we often do readers advisory for them because we're in the library. So we know exactly you know, what all the newest books, all the newest materials are, things that they might not be aware of. And we will come in and bring that to them and like, hey, have you heard of this new book by Kate Quinn? I know you're really into historical fiction, so you might like this title. So um, kind of in relation to this, and this is something I kind of like um, have read a lot about on line, but there's a lot of articles that talk about how creating lifelong learning experiences and social interactions really help improve the lives of like um, individuals, particularly um, seniors who might be experiencing social isolation and just doesn't have the opportunities. This is something I've talked about in previous pre presentation I did, but as adults, we often don't have too many opportunities to learn and um, basically, I guess, explore our interests for free. And so we kind of, as libraries, provide that service when we come in and do these lobby stops for them. So, uh, next slide. So how we meet our patrons needs. So, um, touched on this, we provide access um, to library materials and particularly, we often um, provide access to um, readers that or sorry, materials that are good for readers with visual impairments. So this library has a pretty extensive large print collection. But in addition to that, we actually also rely on a service called Colorado Talking Books that um, is another separate offsite collection that it serves all of the libraries in Colorado. But we have an account with them. And so they also um, expand our access to large print books that many of our um, library um, lobby stop patrons request. Um, we also, um, when we have the time, we promote e-resources e as well, because you can often adjust the print or um, download it as an e-book, I mean, not an e-book, an e-audio book, and so, listen to the, and so that you can listen to the book if you're that, if you prefer that um, format as well. Uh, we offer readers advisory suggestions. So um, we have been, um, many times the patrons will tell us what kind of authors they're interested in, and so like, we'll always keep on the lookout for the latest um, book by da David Baldacci or John Grisham. But kind of in addition to that, I mean, there's only, those guys only write one or two or three books a year. So of course, if we're visiting 
you know, them twice a month. We can't, we can't always help the latest, greatest John Grisham book. So we often use um, our knowledge of like what's out there to kind of um, find them alternative resources. Oh, you like John Grisham? Well, maybe you'll like um, this legal thriller author as well. And so, and um, kind of in addition to that, um, especially um, when we have these conversations with our lobby top patrons, it also helps us kind of shape the uh, collection that we have in the library. So, and I often rely on like these, I mean, sorry, conversations that uh, Maria and Jennifer will have with their patrons where they often come back with request lists from our patrons that, especially for our large print materials that with the library might not have yet. So I take that into heavy consideration when I'm purchasing new books and materials for the library. So uh, next slide. So the tools we use, um, we rely on um, Polaris a lot, um, the leak catalog. Um, I'm, think, I'm thinking of like the, uh, I guess staff um, user interface. I'm probably butchering the tech words for that, but. <laughs> Do that very well. Actually. Oh, okay. Yay. <laughs> the, the only thing I would add is there's, a, there's a series of tools in Polaris which allow us to manage those relationships, I think, better than our previous uh, system did. You may disagree, but um, the idea is that this is a special group of users, right? They're using the library differently. And so our system should reflect that in both allowing for uh, some, some tracking of some data, but also some extra sort of help that the librarians can provide. Exactly, perfect. It lets us track their reading history, for instance. So since we are picking, um, picking books for them, it lets us make, basically it keeps us from accidentally picking a book that we gave them, you know, six months ago that we may not remember, remember the title, but the system's like, gives us a little message like, oh, oops, you already checked this out to them. Let's try again. So um, it also lets us store their preferences. Um, and we also do this with Google Docs as well. But again, we have a list of what each patron, we keep lists of what each patron is interested in. So everything from authors to general subjects so that we can like every time we are picking out books for them, we kind of re kind of refer back to that. So we, um, as Katie has mentioned, we also rely on our personal um, vehicles between the three of us. And I say the three of us, Maria and Jennifer are the primary um, lobby stop um, drivers. I also though offer backup in case anyone is not available. But um, I kind of calculated out and about um, between the three of us, we do about 265 miles per year on our personal vehicles. Um, some, of the, some of our vehicles are better suited for this than others. I have a little measly sedan and I keep telling myself every year I'm going to, my next car is going to be a hatchback so I can actually fit things in it. <laughs> um, but in addition to that, we also use a lot of mobile folding carts that we load up um, the books in and kind of like that helps us like carry the um, books into the or whatever materials we're bringing into the facilities that we're visiting. And so um, kind of next slide, the connections we make. And this is something I know I've been talking a lot. So I wanted to kind of like give Maria the opportunity to kind of speak a little bit to her experiences um, with um, lobby stops. But um, as we kind of mentioned one, um, mentioned, one of the things that's great about the lobby stops is that we have the opportunity to socialize with our lobby stop patrons. And so, Maria, would you like to share some of the experiences that you've had? Is it working? Okay, there we go. That's not even Okay, so I am brand spanking new. I have only been here for 30 odd days, um, but I have had opportunity to go to my lobby stops twice over the month. And on both occasions, I've made amazing connections with the patrons there. Um, just like Bud was saying, it's it's not just about bringing them books and it's been wonderful. And even on my very first day, they're so excited to see me. They're just thrilled. They, you know, love my jewelry, love my, with my outfit, just eager and desperate for a connection with another person. Um, in addition to just so excited to see what's in the bag, what's in the cart, you know, we lay out on the table. In addition to the things we select for them, we also bring 
some other things that maybe if someone's <clears throat> passing by that isn't on our list to choose things for, maybe they want a book that we can check out for them, or maybe there's something else that catches their eye and they're just so super excited to sort of have a little library experience where the books are laid out and they can browse and choose something on their own. Um, I've been in someone's room where they're showing me pictures from their son's wedding and their grandbabies and you know just taking that time to sit with them and chat with them is is really precious and valuable and um, I had one patron that going using our resources going through and seeing what she liked saw that she likes biographies of old celebrities and so I picked a um, Jacqueline Onassis book and I brought it to her and we sat down, she was so excited to tell me about her first day at work at the gas company. She'll never forget it. That was the day that the president was shot and it happened to be her first day at work. And this particular book had a center section with a bunch of photographs. And we sat down together and looked through all those photographs and um, she, it was just wonderful for both of us, you know, um, to hear that firsthand account of what it was like that day being in the workplace and hearing that news. and her being a brand new employee and a young girl. And um, it was just really, really special. And I thoroughly enjoy the connection that I'm making with the patrons and the lobby stops. And um, I'm excited to hear that we're gonna expand and go to more because um, it's very rewarding. Yeah, I even have my own, as few times as I've done it, I even have my um, own favorite patrons. One is, her name is Mary Von Allman. The few times I've been able to visit her, she's always telling me about her family and her grandkids. And so, yes, Ron? Do you help them with ebooks at all? Yes, when they request it, many of our patrons or um, lobby stop patrons are still, I guess you could say they favor the, they, or rather they prefer the regular print. The most, um, I guess you could say, tech um, savvy or tech people that prefer the ebook options, we've actually encountered in Good Sam. So that was actually another reason we actually started the uh, tech time of visits up there was to kind of like help people who were um, asking about our e our e sorry our e resources, um, both to spread knowledge of what we have as well as just to help them access it. Okay. Is that okay? So um, in addition to socializing with our lobby stop patrons. It also gives us the opportunity to um, use our community partnerships to bring like, um, programming to these senior living facilities. So there's kind of like a picture of an event we did in 2019. We actually partnered with a um, lady named Betsy Cullum. She was from the Wizard, yeah, Windsor Severance Historical Society. And so she did talk about the POW camps that used to be in Greeley. And it was just a very well-received program. We have um, a different program where it was also, uh, this was done by someone in children's services, but it was, we called it an intergenerational story time where we brought a musician and we, it was an event that brought um, children and the senior residents of the facility together. And it was just like a really good time. They read stories, they sang, they made a nice little craft. And so basically, but this lobby stop, um, these lobby stops kind of like opened the door for us to kind of bring our, that create those experiences and bring our pro programming into these um, outside facilities. So uh, next slide. So just um, kind of looking to the future, we are always on the lookout for requests from new facilities, um, like for instance, Resort 55. Um, Kind of, we partner with uh, mobile services to assess whether it's better for us to visit that place or them as well, or them. Uh, with our own, with the facilities that we are currently visiting, we always look, we're always looking for opportunities for new patron recruit recruitment. So we have forms that we often share with the residents as well as um, the facility staff to try and get new people to sign up for our programs or sorry, our lobby stops. And then we're just always reassessing our existing patrons' needs. So we're often, we have forms that where we ask the current uh, lobby stop patrons, hey, you may have been interested in or into John Grisham this year. Maybe you want to read Lee Childs next year. So we're always constantly working with our patrons to make sure that we are keeping um, up to date with what they're interested in and that we're meeting their needs. 
So, and we've also been looking, I know like Windsor, the Windsor severance areas are like, their populations are constantly growing. I believe, and I, I believe the, they say that like 30% of um, the Windsor severance population is about um, people that are ages 55 and up. So basically um, our potential like customer or client base is like constantly expanding the area. So we are looking for new facilities all the time that we can service that we aren't currently servicing. So, so that is uh, my presentation for the time being, but yeah, question? Well, and it's just kind of a special part in my heart. Um, do we have anything reaching out to the shut-ins? There are elderly who are really just shut into their homes. Um, is there any way for them to register to have a visit maybe monthly or is that not a, something we would be able to do? It's just a, it's, it's just a soft spot because yeah. it's, they're, not in a, they're not in a facility. Typically they don't have a lot of family but they really can't afford to move their house. And so they're kind of just, just here. <laughs> Uh, it's something we have gotten a request in the past, and because um, like mobile services, we are limited in our staff time or our staff resources that we can devote to it. I only have two part-time um, assistants, and lobby stops is not the only um, responsibility that we have for adult services. But it's something I was actually thinking when, um, Ron, you were mentioning the people or the person, I guess, I don't know if you were thinking of a specific individual, who could not um, get? Who could not access the uh, bookmobile? Mm -hmm. That might be something we can look into the future. Is um, I would like to like explore it, but for I would just say for the time being, we have mostly been focusing on the senior res residences because that's kind of I guess you could say where we get the most bang for our buck, where we can um, ex ex um, access the greater crowds. But I wouldn't be opposed to it. Yeah, sure. yeah. No, it's all, it all comes down to dollars and cents and staffing, and I get that too. Yes. So, Jennifer, I, I applaud what you guys do. And I wasn't, I didn't really understand how you interacted with Bookmobile. Now I see this one two combination thing, and it, it makes a lot of sense to me now. So, yes. thank you for clearing that up. And uh, I think it's something the community needs. I do have a couple other questions, quick questions for you. You talk about the Colorado Talking Services. Um, Colorado Talking Books. Books, yeah. Do you deliver that material as well? Yes. So, so it's delivered here and then you take that. Yes. Okay. So again, part of the services is, yeah, we make the request for the books. We track who has them. Then when the, um, the patrons are done with them, we take them back and return them to the Colorado Talking Books. It, it's yeah. worth saying that that yeah. service is available to any library patron. They are acting as the agent for the patrons who aren't coming no, to the library, if that makes sense. Yes. Thing, I was looking at your mileage. I had that question about how you deliver books. And you're talking about 265 miles per year per vehicle. That's that's like 750 miles not, a year. No, no, not sorry, not. I should have explained that better. Um, all together. So between the three, three of you, it's 750 miles. That's nothing. no 265. For all three of you? That's, yes. That's pretty small. Yeah. That's less than a mile a, 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 a day. You realize that, right? Yes. yes I mean, most of the facilities are right here in Memphis. It's, it's still less than a mile a day. It's not very far. And because they go quite a mile, so they're not going out every week. So it spreads it out. It's not a lot of time. But it is difficult to work with folks. Yes. They couldn't access it. They couldn't really get up the steps on the bookmobile very well. And so they weren't really using it. But they, they liked having interaction with the people. They just couldn't get on the vehicle and go the steps very well. Yeah. As Katie mentioned, if they were to get the uh, individualized carrier 
um, cars, I forget, sorry what the term used, basically we would rely on them as well. And so they would, again, like prevent like not only the rent wear and tear of our own personal vehicles, but they would just be a little bit more specialized for carrying um, not only the, bo the books and materials that we check out to them per patron, one of the things I actually glossed over and I forgot to mention is that we um, want to, in the future as things are kind of opening back up, we actually want to go back to kind of doing programming in these um, facilities. And we, my department, we've kind of had conversations about um, doing things like take and make kits. And so that would be additional materials that we would be bringing in that we would want like space for. So. I, I think it's great. Yeah, Ron? We're the long-term planning committee. So in, in regards to your presentation, what are the things we need to be aware of as far as services and costs in the future? So in terms of us, we don't really have our own separate budget. Um, I would say that's kind of like rolled into adult programming. So I'm not seeing like any current additional um, costs. So like, for instance, if we do do, if we are able to do like our take and make kits, um, we would just roll that into our general adult programming budget. So as far as I know, it's covered the big, the basic thing we would look for is if we would be able to use if like if, if an approval was made for the additional vehicles, we would be able to rely on those as well. Okay, thank you. Casey has an answer to Ron's question. Yeah. Yeah. JC, could you go ahead and um, I believe this is in regard to the bookmobile and mileage. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm sorry to get things off track. I just found it. Um, so it was in that document, Katie, the bookmobile maintenance history. From 2013 to 2017, um, we averaged 6,325 miles annually. 2018, we were down a little closer to 5,000. 2019, we were up a little closer to 7,000. Uh, 2020, let's see, only like 3,000. These are personal miles or bookmobile miles? No, 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 bookmobile. He had asked earlier. This is Lucy. This is Lucy's miles, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Yeah. Question? I love the service, that's all. Thank you. I think you guys are doing a critical service to the library district and, you know, impressive. Thank you for your time. Yeah, sure. My family was at the all generation one at Good Sam. Oh, my kids and my grandparents. Oh, perfect. They love I know. Them. I saw, like, I was not there personally, like, um, but I definitely saw all the pictures and video, and I think there was even some video, and I was just, like, so happy to see that event. That, that event was able you to report to Casey? Yeah, I, re well, yeah, I just, we, uh, we do. I report directly, Maria, and reports to me. So I oversee her, the department. Okay. Great, thank you. What I bet to you two guys. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking about me, Maria. I, I saw the connect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank awesome. you, Jennifer and Maria. Yeah. Very Thanks. well done. I thought it was great hearing about um, the the rap getting such so much ex, um, excitement. Um, I really like that comment that was shared. Well, it's like night and day, and there's no chill. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the library book movement is so clear. It's the letter. Yeah. 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 No, I just uh, I thought uh, you know it, it's. It was on the books for 2020 and didn't get done yeah. for, I don't know what the reason was. There's something going around. Um, so, but, you know, it was, I'm glad we were able to get that done. Um, I think it's um, the refresh that we've done um, will help us as we move forward. And um, you guys are really the first one out there um, showing that we're, we, things are happening. So I think it's I, Great job and a 57 Chevy is still a 57 Chevy. <laughs>
All right, that's wrapping up thank that. You, we want to thank um, Mobile and Outreach Services for their presentation and sharing what they do on a regular basis. It's always a, a pleasure to see our people at work. Um, thank you, Casey, for your great leadership. Um, well, next on the agenda at this point, we're sticking with new businesses, Regional Library. Um, Ron, uh, Trustee Clark, you had brought that up, so I'll hand you the hand that over to you. Well, we are the long-term planning committee. And as I remember during our discussions or months during the facilities plan, one of the things we always kept in our sites was a state-of-the-art regional library, hopefully centrally located in our district that would serve as a hub for branches uh, in the northern part of our district, southern part of our district, and maybe even into West Greeley. That was always kind of the prize that, uh, as I remember, that we, we kept in mind. I can remember the icons that were presented and the regional library was always a part of that. I hope we don't lose sight of that. Um, as I look at, at the population growth in this area, that Windsor is going to be right smack dab in the middle of a, of a metroplex. And <clears throat> I see at the present time very little in the way of cultural identity that we have. Hopefully that will change uh, because um, it gives us the identity that makes us special, makes us what we are. And, uh, you know, I see that oh, a regional library can very well be the, the um, center point of this, so this cultural campus that I hope eventually will take place. One of the things that I think that's, uh, that's um, interesting that I don't think that we're aware of is that not only is there a need, but we have an architect in this who is from Greeley that is a world-class architect and who has indicated that he would love to build a regional library in, in this area. And can you pull up, the, uh, uh, his name is Dan Meese. I know the Meese family's been in, Greeley, in Windsor for ages. They had the Firehouse Restaurant. Dan uh, is, as I mentioned, he designs world-class buildings all over the world. I think it's M-I-E-S. I could have the I-E in the reverse, but I think it's M-I-E-S. Yeah, yeah, pull him up because it's, he's got an interesting, he, he's, got, he's an interesting guy. He's homegrown Windsor uh, young man. And as a matter of fact, he, um, yeah, he happens to be a classmate of uh, Martin Lynn and Christy Melendez, which I think, you know, may be pretty important. He has stated that he would love to build a regional library. And in fact, he has said that he would um, spend, he would take whatever time was necessary to do it. He would put everything else on the table and, and do that. So I know that he's, he's interested in the community that he grew up in and would be more than happy to do that. So I'm hoping that our committee keeps that in mind in the future because I think it's really the prize that we should be, um, uh, as be aspiring to. I, I think that it will you know, require cooperation with another entity, mainly the city of the town of Windsor. And uh, hopefully some vision will occur in that area that will help because I think that in accomplishing this, the library could certainly use a, a strong partner. So can you bring up... Uh, yeah. And I, you know, uh, yeah, I'll pull up some of the stuff that he, this is an example of some of the stuff that he has done. Um, 
know, he, I think he, at the present time, he lives in New York. His sister says that he's next door neighbor is Ina Garten, you know, the barefoot Contessa. But uh, so he's world renowned and uh, a, a Windsor guy. So I think this is something we should keep in mind is all I'm trying to say. Well, I appreciate that. That would be lovely. Um, you know, we definitely are on a, I believe it was 10 to 15 years was our goal um, to get that. Um, and, um, you know, we certainly will, uh, it will be in our notes. Um, you know, we might have to reach back out to you and say, who is that guy? No. Well, uh, I just hope we keep the conversation up with other entities, mainly the town of Windsor, you know, and, and the uh, town board, members of the town board. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they come and go. And they just, do. And, uh, but uh, hopefully at some time in the future, they'll, the need for some central cultural identity in our town will become apparent. And I'm hopeful that a, I mean, libraries have changed as we all have witnessed, they're <laughs> community centers. And I'm hopeful that uh, when this time comes that we are in a position to, to move forward with some type of uh, community uh, regional library that will be state of the art and serve us well and serve our district well. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I'm just really enjoying, I don't, it's like, where was, where, where's this little, block house or <laughs> it's, it's pretty it reminds me of something you'd see know. in Dubai or something <laughs> but it's it's really cool you know and also um and what there, wouldn't it be a... neat if he came to town do a talk have him come and be a visitor and talk um have a you know just to get him out there I wonder if he's written any books you know um it'd be if he has any books or table coffee table books you know what i mean That'd i don't know great. about that but, but, but i'm just saying it would I'll be great look. to have you know and you know and i'm just brainstorming but wouldn't it be fun to have a section in a library um that was local um featured all local like even if it's a coffee table book you know here's a uh, an architect you know that you know came from windsor or severance or West Greeley, you know, just, I, I you know, thinking, but. Well, he, he visits Windsor periodically. He doesn't live here anymore, yeah, but he visits here. here. Let's have, let's would it, do you think it would be worthwhile for him to come to a board meeting or something like that, Ann, and talk to us? What do you think? I'm just throwing this open. Oh, if he does it for free. That's what I was leaning towards, just to keep his name out there. Um, I think the first way to get him to okay. engage would do a would do an Maybe adult I program. Understand. I think that would be awesome. I would come. Um, you know, I think having. I think there's so much education and adult. Um, we're, we're not up to, to doing adult programming yet. Um, to my knowledge, we're getting closer. We are. Yeah, we're doing programs in the okay. building for adult audiences. We're just limiting capacity. Oh, I need um, to. I missed yeah, them. look it up. You missed the fall wreath last night. Well, I, I like more second? the history or the learning ones. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Check out the, the calendar. I will. Do, do we have a section in the library for local authors? We had a feature on our website for a while of local authors. That was yeah, something. Yeah, we that... used to do a yeah a local author spotlight, and uh, it was featured on our website and in our newsletter. Um, and we just kind of stopped doing it because we kind of just stopped getting submissions. So uh, we were doing it for a little while though. Okay. All right, well, um, Ron, thank you for bringing this to our thank attention. Thank you for listening. I do, I try. That's why I say thank you. <laughs> no, we, we appreciate it. And uh, that was pretty exciting seeing his work. So I'm glad you had the website there. All right, that is it for new business. So now we're gonna go up to old business and that's an update on the facilities plan. And I'm going to have that to our director, Clean.
So let's see. Uh, tomorrow is Friday. And Friday we have to start scoping out the program for the PD project. So actually we still get into the progress. We'll probably go a little bit easier on children because we had a few other deadlines last night and they had appointments. We had a contact with them that on the doctor and last Thursday we had some encounter contact. And not to interrupt you, but when did we send them the contract originally? The one that they uh, got to us Thursday with marked up. So they sent the contract on Thursday. No, I mean, but it was it was our contract they marked up. They sent us on Thursday, right? Uh, oh, that was that was their version of the contract. That, that's what I'm getting at. Bill sent them the original contract. Bill sent the contract. They sent it back to us on Thursday. So how long did they have it between when Bill sent it? Would you please, it's key, because I've had a conversation with Stephen Gallardi, and he was talking about the bushwhack thing. And I said, dude, you did the same thing. He says, but, but Nick had an answer. I said, no, Nick had the contract for, I think, two weeks prior. What he it, only sent it to us when Ann hit him up. That's just what I was going to say is what it sounded like he intimated last night was the only reason he returned anything at all was that Ann said, hey, we, we really would like to do something. But he didn't you know, say that. He said, I only, you know, I did it that way because she said I had to have it to you by that day, mm -hmm. which is not right. correct. Where is it? It was our red, it, he redlined our agreement, Bill's agreement. So can you tell me when Bill sent it to him? I thought it was like two weeks prior to that. My point of it is he sat on it until you prompted him. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on from this because we've got other things. Do you, do you have a key to Ash Street I could borrow? I want to go there and look around again before Friday's meeting. Yeah, I could meet you over there. I don't have a spare alarm code right now, but I could meet you over there sometime this week. Okay. Uh, uh, tomorrow sometime? Yeah, we can coordinate calendars after the meeting. Yeah, I, I want to walk back through it sure. for, for a few. I'm not, I'm not talking about 10 minutes. I want to spend some time in the, prior to the Friday meeting so I can fully... Um, just, uh, I, I did speak at the, um, for those of you who tuned in, I did speak at the, um, town meeting. I got my three minutes. Um, you know, it, the consensus is, is yes, they want to work with us. Yes. They want a library there. We have hit a couple bumps in the road and that is typical real estate. Um, you know, there's been some, unfortunately, some miscommunication and misunderstanding of where we were, and that did create um, some uncomfortable moments. Um, but I think there's nothing there to that cannot be overcome. Um, 
and I think we are going to, I, I know we're going to continue moving forward. Um, I just think we would like to move a little faster than we are able. Um, the one thing that we had a concern with was, you know, under getting the IGA. Based on their rules and regulations, we will not be able to get an IGA with them until we go through the planning and building permit um, process. So that leaves some uncontrollable costs in our um, budgeting that I'm not sure exactly how to address that. Um, but nothing's insurmountable. Um, and I feel like we learned, I personally am glad I went to the meeting. I'm glad I had an opportunity to talk and get some clarification. Um, but yeah, I think in the future, um, it would behoove us to really do an email that we outline our understanding because there was a lack of understanding of what was being offered after our last meeting. Madam President, I've got a three o'clock doctor's appointment. Go ahead. I've got a bail too, so. Yep, that's fine. Um, that's all I was going to, to say. I wanted to make sure we left on a positive note. Um, if there's no other discussion, I need a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. I I'll second, second that. All in favor say aye. Aye. All of that would like to stay, stay. Um, otherwise, we're adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks.